Hello Year 3 and 4. We've chosen a lovely book for us all to read together. It's The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. I remember reading this as a child. Chapter 1. Lucy looks into the wardrobe. Once there were four children whose names were Peter, Susan, Edmund and Lucy. This story is about something that happened to them when they were sent away from London during the war because of the air raids. They were sent to the house of an old professor who lived in the heart of the country, 10 miles from the nearest railway station and two miles from the nearest post office. He had no wife and he lived in a very large house with a housekeeper called Mrs McCready and three servants. Their names were Ivy, Margaret and Betty, but they did not come into the story much. He himself was a very old man with shaggy white hair, which grew over most of his face as well as on his head, and they liked him almost at once. But on the first evening, when he came out to meet them at the front door, he was so odd-looking that Lucy, who was the youngest, was a little afraid of him. And Edmund, who was the next youngest, wanted to laugh and had to keep on pretending he was blowing his nose to hide it. As soon as they had said goodnight to the professor and gone upstairs on the first night, the boys came into the girls' room and they all talked it over. We've fallen on our feet and no mistake, said Peter. This is going to be perfectly splendid. That old chap will let us do anything we like. I think he's an old dear, said Susan. Oh, come off it, said Edmund, who was tired and pretending not to be tired, which always made him bad-tempered. Don't go on talking like that. Like what, said Susan. And anyway, it's time you were in bed. Trying to talk, to, like, trying to talk like mother, said Edmund. And who are you to say that I'm, what I'm going to do to bed? Go to bed yourself. Hadn't we all better go to bed, said Lucy. There's sure to be a row we've heard talking here. No, there won't, said Peter. I tell you, this is the sort of house where no one's going to mind what we do. Anyway, they won't hear us. It's about ten minutes' walk from here down to the dining room and any amount of stairs and passages in between. What's that noise, said Lucy suddenly. It was a far larger house than she'd ever been in before and the thought of all those long passages and rows of doors leading into empty rooms was beginning to make her feel a little creepy. It's only a bird, silly, said Edmund. It's an owl, said Peter. This is going to be a wonderful place for birds. I shall go to bed now. I say, let's go and explore tomorrow. You might find anything in a place like this. Did you see those mountains as we came along? And the woods? There might be eagles. There might be stags. There'll be hawks. Badgers, said Lucy. Foxes, said Edmund. Rabbits, said Susan. But when the next morning came, there was a steady rain falling so thick that when you looked out of the window you could see neither the mountains, nor the woods, nor even the stream in the garden. Of course it would be raining, said Edmund. They had just finished their breakfast with the professor and were upstairs in the room he had set apart for them. A long low room with two windows looking out in one direction and two in another. Do stop grumbling, Ed, said Susan. Talk to one. It will clear up in an hour. And in the meantime, we're pretty well off. There's a wireless and lots of books. Not for me, said Peter. I'm going to explore in the house. Everyone agreed to do this, and that was how the adventures began. It was the sort of house that you never seemed to come to the end of, and it was full of unexpected places. The first doors they tried led only to spare rooms, as everyone had expected that they would. But soon they came to a very long room full of pictures, and there they found a suit of armour. And after that was a room all hung with green, with a harp in one corner. And then came three steps down and five steps up, and then a kind of little upstairs hall and a door that led out of the balcony. And then a whole series of rooms that led into each other that were lined with books. Most of them very old books, and some bigger than a Bible in a church. And shortly after they looked into the room that was quite empty except for one big wardrobe. The sort that was, had a looking glass in the door. There was nothing else in the room at all except a dead blue bottle on the windowsill. Nothing there, said Peter, and they all trooped out again, all except Lucy. She stayed behind because she thought it would be worthwhile trying the door of the wardrobe, even though she felt almost sure it would be locked. To her surprise, it opened quite easily and two mothballs dropped out. Looking into the inside, she saw several coats hanging up and mostly long fur coats. There was nothing Lucy liked so much as the smell and feel of fur. She immediately stepped into the wardrobe and got in among the coats and rubbed her face against them, leaving the door open. 
Of course, because she knew it would be very foolish to shut oneself into any wardrobe. Soon she went further in and found there was a second row of coats hanging up behind the first one. It was almost quite dark in there, and she kept her arms stretched out in front of her so as not to bump her face into the back of the wardrobe. She took a step further in, then two steps or three steps, almost expecting to feel woodwork against the tips of her fingers, but she could not feel it. This must be a simply enormous wardrobe, thought Lucy, going still further in and pushing the soft folds of the coats aside to make room for her. Then she noticed there was something crunchy under her feet. I wonder if that must be more mothballs, she thought, stooping down to feel it with her hand. But instead of feeling the hard, smooth wood of the wall floor of the wardrobe, she felt something soft and powdery and extremely cold. This is very queer, she said, and went on a step or two further. Next moment, she found she was rubbing against her face and hands were no longer soft fur, but something hard and rough and even prickly. Why, just like branches of trees, exclaimed Lucy. And then she saw there was a light ahead of her, not a few inches away where the back of the wardrobe ought to have been, but a long way off. Something cold and soft was falling on her. A moment later, she found that she was standing in the middle of a wood, at night time, with snow under her feet, with snowflakes falling through the air. Lucy felt a little frightened, but she felt very inquisitive and excited as well. She looked back over her shoulder and there, between the dark tree trunks, she could still see the open doorway of the wardrobe and even catch a glimpse of the empty room from which she had set out. She had, of course, left the door open, for she knew it, that it would be very silly to shut oneself into a wardrobe. It seemed to be still daylight there. I can always get back if anything goes wrong, thought Lucy. She began to walk forward, crunch, crunch, over the snow and through the wood towards the other light. In about ten minutes she reached it and found it was a lamppost. As she stood looking into it, wondering where there was a lamp, why there was a lamppost in the middle of the wood, and wondering what to do next, she heard a pitter-patter of feet coming towards her. And soon after, that a very strange person stepped out from among the trees, into the light of the lamp pot. He was only a little taller than Lucy herself, and he carried over his head an umbrella, white with snow. From the waist upwards, he was like a man, but his legs were shaped like a goat's. The hair on them was glossy black, and instead of feet, he had goat's hooves. He also had a tail, but Lucy did not notice this at first, because he was neatly caught up under the arm that held the umbrella, so as to keep it from trailing in the snow. He had a red woolen muffler round his neck, and his skin was rather reddish too. He had a strange but pleasant little face, with a short pointed beard and curly hair, and out of the hair there struck two horns, one on each side of his forehead. One of his hands, as I have said, held the umbrella. In the other arm he carried several brown paper parcels. What with the parcels and the snow, it looked just as if he had been doing Christmas shopping. He was a fawn, and when he saw Lucy he gave such a start of surprise that he dropped all of his parcels. Goodness gracious me, exclaimed the fawn, 